So sexual healing is not just a Marvin Gaye song. <laughs> sexual healing is something that I think the whole world is starving for right now. And in this room, we've come together as brothers and sisters to try and make the world a better place and really starting by being willing to change ourselves. And so, you know, I've seen so many courses about meditation and self-development, and the one area that gets left out and gets left in the shadow is our sexuality, which is literally the core that your whole life is built on. We've all come from sex, and it's the most natural thing. And somehow, instead of holding it as sacred, and the most sacred thing two people could experience together, we've made it something dirty or shameful or embarrassing. And because of that, there's been a lot more suffering in the world than is necessary. And so it's really my mission to you know, break free of those taboos and to step into a new paradigm. And I know everyone in this room is ready for that, right? And from this room, we can take it out into the world. So I wanted to start out by sharing a success story because some of the things I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna share my story with you um, about you know, years that I lived crippled with shame and wasn't able to really live my life and my purpose because of that. But starting with a, a beautiful success story, I showed up here at AFEST and I was having dinner uh, with a couple and this woman says, oh, you know, I took your master class with Vision on Tantra Touch and just in that 90-minute master class, she had a memory of a trauma that she had suppressed because she'd had shame. And when it came up into the light for her, she was able to release it. And her partner's sitting there at dinner with her and he's gritting from ear to ear and he's like, yes. And then after that, we, when we made love, she had full body orgasms <laughs> and multiple orgasms. And, and that's really just because um, that's natural when we feel free. That's natural when we can relax. I think God gave us <laughs> orgasms <laughs> as, as a way to you know, make, make life really wonderful, beautiful, and sometimes bearable. <laughs> um, but you know, I became a sex expert because I had a background in sexual abuse. And that abuse and shame led me to some very dark places in my life. And ultimately, I hit a rock bottom and I had to go on a journey to heal myself. And I was so desperate and hungry for that, I flew halfway around the world, you know, gave up everything, risked everything to meet a teacher, my Tantra teacher, in the jungles of India. And he taught me about sacred sexuality. And I realized that this was something so necessary in our modern world. And so that's really my mission. I've taken what was my greatest wound, my greatest power, in that I can now help carry other people through their dark places and into the other side to empowerment and light around our sexuality and spirituality. Because there's an orgasmic breakthrough on the other end for all of us. <laughs> and you know, so to share a little bit about myself and my backstory, you know, now, um, now I live a life where I travel around the world and I talk about sex. I've had a TV show, I have another TV show, and you know, I've worked with tens of thousands of people over 10 years in person as a healer. I've worked with celebrities and professional athletes and billionaires, and I can tell you everyone has one thing in common, and that's we all need uh, a better connection with sacred sexuality. And, and so that's why it's really time, and that's why we're gonna do that here. And you know, I've developed, I guess, because of my background, a superpower that I can look at anyone and see if their sexual energy is blocked. And those blockages are what I call intimacy blocks, because in Tantra, we don't believe sex is just about having sex. It's understanding that sexual energy is this powerful, creative force inside of us that manifests and creates our entire life. So everything from your money to your beliefs about yourself to your family are all directly connected to that energy. 
So if you have intimacy blocks around that shakti, that sexual energy, it is affecting all these areas that you're trying to change. And memory is not held in your mind. Memory is actually held in your body. So we have to start utilizing our body and let go of all the body shame. I mean, even in this room, a lot of you have body shame, you know, because that's our culture. So I grew up, not the sexually liberated, <laughs> I grew up um, on a Christian cult. And I lived in a log cabin. My parents had both grown up in the city, and it was a time in history where there was the Vietnam War, and a lot of people were tired of mainstream society and wanted to create an alternate reality. So I sort of grew up as a social experiment. <laughs> and, you know, with, with this uh, log cabin, I had no uh, indoor electricity, no plumbing. And some of my earliest memories were my mom, like, chopping, you know, firewood with an axe to make us dinner on a wood-burning stove. And there were things about growing up like that that were really beautiful and I think gave me a very unique kind of perspective on life. The church that I went to was very charismatic. And so, um, you know, they would speak in tongues and do faith healing. And sometimes people would get hit with the Holy Spirit and start <laughs> rolling around the room. They would say, get out of the way. <laughs> if somebody's possessed by the Holy Spirit, you just might accidentally get hit. <laughs> Uh, because they were just sort of releasing themselves into some form of freedom where the rest of their life was so repressed. And what was beautiful in that environment for me was I felt a direct connection to that energy or that spirit. And I felt it as a physical energy that would run in my body. And even I remember being five years old and I would wake up at night and sit up and just like rock myself with this feeling of like tingling hot and cold energy and I didn't know what to call it, so I thought, oh, this is, you know, this is the Holy Spirit or this. The angels are visiting me. This is my special time of feeling this connection to God. And I was a, I was a very good girl. My name was Psalm, so I already felt like I was special. <laughs> and I memorized all my scripture verses every week. And I remember at my school, we would go to lunch, and before lunch, we would pray. And I would get out of my chair and actually like get on my knees in the classroom and like I'd seen an old picture book like pray and the other kids would laugh at me and I remember thinking like I don't care because this is between me and God and I'm saved. <laughs> like, I don't know about you <laughs> but I'm saved. And so with this like incredibly strong feeling of connection to God it was like going from heaven to living in a complete nightmare when one day my mom told me that my father had molested at least 10 of my friends who all went to the same Christian school as me where my father was the principal. And ironically, the school was called the Good Shepherd School. And, you know, in an environment where sex isn't talked about and there's already so much discomfort and shame, there's really nowhere to go to talk about it. And at the same time that my mother told me that, she also told me that he never, she said, he never did it to you. And in that moment, it was like, you know, a hand of silence was put on my throat that I still even physically feel sometimes today when I share my story. Because again, memory lives in the body so much more than your brain. And because, you know, as children, when we count on our parents, I, I had to keep that agreement of shame and silence for her to love me, to give me attention, to give me food, to have somewhere to live, and that became directly connected to my survival mechanisms, that sense of shame. And I remember after that, she, she actually had a nervous breakdown and became very violent with my father and with me and my younger brothers. And I remember one night, her chasing my father around the house with a knife and pinning him against a wall. And she held the knife to his throat and she said, you know, the world would be a better place if you were dead. And even though that was my abuser, it was still my father. And I remember that night I went and I took all the knives in the house and I put them under my pillow. And I got down on my knees and I prayed to God again. I thought, you know, 
I've got a relationship with God. And I remember saying, God, would, would you just look down here on my family because I know if you saw what was happening, you would stop this because there's no way God could let this much suffering happen in this world. And I really believed that there would be a magic wand that would be waved and all the violence and all the pain would just disappear. And when I woke up the next morning, everything was the same. It was the same nightmare. And I remember at that point, I just lost faith. I lost faith in God. I lost faith in people. I lost faith in the world. And I just didn't even want to be alive anymore. But I never went and asked for help because I'd made an agreement of that shame and that silence. And I remember my mom saying, if you go out and you tell anybody, you tell your friends, you tell a teacher, they'll put your dad in jail or they'll probably kill him. And they'll put you and your brothers in foster care. And however bad this is at home, that's worse. And I finally reached a point where being a good girl for so long hadn't done anything for me. <laughs> and something snapped. And so I became rebellious. And I started drinking and sneaking out at night. And so my family sent me to a Christian boarding school to fix me. And I remember going to this Christian boarding school and somebody gave me LSD. <laughs> and I just thought, I don't need any of this reality. And I'm just gonna leave it all behind. I don't want any of this, too many lies in this world. Too many people not telling the truth. And I ran away at 17 years old, and I did what a lot of teenage girls with sexual abuse do. I got pregnant because I wanted some connection to unconditional love. And then I was 17 years old, holding a baby, still a child myself, and I didn't have any tools yet to heal my own trauma. And my 20s just became a blur of you know, drugs and sex and alcohol and anything to numb the pain of these inner demons. I remember one night putting my son to bed and being like, Sam, you can be good, just be good, just stay home. But it was like there's this fire inside me and, and it's impossible to describe what it's like when you can't get out of your own skin but you're filled with all this, just like raging demons. I called that the, the mean reds, <laughs> worse than depression. And I went out that night and I got drunk, and I went home with some random person, and I woke up early and snuck into my bedroom window in the morning so my son wouldn't see me come in the front door while he made his cereal and got ready for school. And I felt so ashamed, and because of my original shame, I felt like I just had no hope to change it all. And I finally went and looked for help with therapy. And I explained to the therapist, you know, I, I have all this trauma, but I also I have these moments that I connect to something so beautiful and so blissful. And I can just be walking down the street and stop and like smell a flower. And, and the fragrance of that flower, it's like I'm transported to this place where it's just like all white light and beauty and bliss and it's ecstatic and it feels orgasmic in my body. And I said, and I feel like that when I have sex. When I have sex, it's beyond even the sex act. Like some transcendent thing happens that I feel like I'm connected to, to something good again and something where we're all one. And I told that to my therapist, and she said, well, that's mania. And so I was diagnosed as bipolar and put on medication, which I was happy to, I was like, call me whatever you want. Call me a blue kangaroo. If it's gonna make me stop being crazy, I'm fine with that. But she gave me lithium, and I didn't have the mean reds anymore, but I didn't have anything. I was totally and completely numb. And I remember not having the energy to get out of bed, gaining 30 pounds. I remember my son coming to me and, at night and saying, will you read me a bedtime story? And I was so lethargic and so tired and disconnected, and I said, can you come back later? And I saw him dejected walking out of the room. And then he asked me again, I said, can you come back later? You know, and you only get so many laters. And when you're parents and you have your own kind of trauma or shame in your body, 
then you can't be present right, with your kids, and that forms who they are. And so after about a year of being on that medication, gaining weight, having you know, no energy, I ended up going broke, and we were almost evicted. And in that moment of almost getting evicted, and I didn't know what to do, I thought, well, they've got me on drugs, so I'm going to go back to using my old drugs because I know what they do. So I found a friend who had crystal meth, and I went, I remember taking a first hit of that again, and my lungs expand. I felt like I'm superwoman. I can do anything. And of course, that cocktail of lithium and crystal meth was deadly, and I ended up in an emergency room. And there was an emergency room, naked, you know, with that little thin cotton robe on, exposed in the back, and feeling so isolated and so small. And I remember I started thinking, I don't even have money to pay to be in this emergency room. And I can't call my parents for help. Everybody else in the world can call their parents for help, but my parents are my abusers. And I have nowhere to go. And, then, and some other voice finally woke up inside me and said, Psalm, do you see that? Do you see that? That's why you're here. Because some broken little five-year-old girl is still so hungry for your parents to come save you, to choose you, to value you. And you keep throwing yourself in these situations with different people or men or sexually and say, somebody choose me and see my value. And that voice said, but the only person who's gonna do that is you. And some other voice said, go do yoga. <laughs> and I was like, I have a real problems. I'm on medication, like yoga's women in Beverly Hills, you know, you know, their husbands work, they drive a minivan, they wear cute outfits. There's like, go do yoga. Cause like, this is your last chance, girl. You end up here again, you do this reenactment pattern one more time, you're dead next time. And I felt that in my bones. So I like, with all my hopelessness and all my brain chatter, one foot in front of the other, I went home, and one foot in front of the other, I went to yoga the next day. And I went to this yoga class, it was by donation, because I was broke. And I remember the teacher said, you know, come to stand at the front of your mat. I don't have a cute outfit on, I'm wearing like pajama bottoms and a wife beater, and I was like, I don't care. <laughs> like, I'm here to save my life. And the teacher said, inhale, raise your arms as you inhale, long, slow, deep inhale. Exhale, long, slow, deep exhale. And again, inhale, long, slow, deep inhale. And I felt, I felt the spirit of God in my body again, where I'd felt nothing but shame and pain for so long. And every time I inhaled, and I felt that like something cared about me, and that life could be good. And I inhaled, and I felt this bliss in my body, and I started to hear a prayer like from my body. And it said, thank you God, because I am beautifully and wonderfully made. And at first I thought, but I thought, I was like, I don't like God. <laughs> I don't pray. God makes me feel bad. Prayer failed me. And I thought, and I don't love my body. I don't want to be here in this planet. But I, went, I did again inhale, and, I, and, it, and that prayer was happening, and I was being filled with all this positive energy. And I thought, you know what? God didn't belong to church. Those were people with problems that were weak and couldn't overcome them. And me and God and this energy, that's mine. And, and in that moment, of I inhale, exhale, and it was beyond that. I was like, inhale, and as I feel this gratitude for my body, and I fought life, and I fought God, and I, I thought everything wasn't fair, and in that moment, I, I felt my body, I felt like I am grateful, and this body, this body is amazing. And this body that, at that point, had only brought me suffering, and my sexual energy, and the way people perceived me, it only brought me pain, and I felt that it was mine, and that this was sacred, and this feeling was orgasmic. And then I went and I tried to find more teachers. I was like, I need more of this, but I need that connection beyond even regular yoga. Or I went to Zen meditation where all the monks had shaved their heads, and I was like, I don't wanna look like a guy. I was like, isn't there somewhere I can go where like, you know, all this works for me? <laughs> like, I think God made me juicy for a reason. You know, take, 
take me to where they like that. <laughs> and then instead of a detriment, that is a, that's, some, that's a powerful thing. And I ended up through a series of miraculous events in India where I met my guru, is not famous, out in the middle of the jungle, and he taught me something. He said, there was a time in this world, a real time, that sex was sacred. And they had temples where people actually went and had sex to worship each other and to tie their pleasure to God as an offering. I was taught that that was what you did and it distracted you from God. And he said that in that time there were priestesses and they helped people learn how to pray in their bodies and experience their sexual sacredness. And in that moment I remembered, oh my God, that's why I'm here. <laughs> and he taught me beautiful things like how to do this breast massage that opens the heart and heals pain and how two people can have sex and connect in such a deeper way on a soul level. And then he said, go out and teach that to the world. And on one hand, I was like, finally, I have my purpose. All this pain makes sense. But I was terrified because I knew people are going to judge me. Nobody's ready to hear this message, and yet they need it so badly. And I remember I just thought, okay, that's what it's mine to do. Somebody's going to be on the front line of that. <laughs> and, and I came back and I started teaching it. And like I said, at this point, I've taught tens of thousands of people in person, millions through TV and the internet. And the fact that I'm standing here on stage at A-Fest means there's already been a paradigm change. And that vision is brave enough to take this step where other places that do self don't won't. Because we need this. And we need this, we need this paradigm shift. And it starts here with everyone in this room and it can go out, you know, into the whole world. And I wanted to show you, I said, uh, while I was here, another beautiful story. One of the women here said that I had taught a meditation, I'm gonna teach you very quickly. It's called the kiss meditation. It's one of, one of the 10 Tantra touch secrets. It's the kiss meditation where you kind of break through again our body shame, our inhibition, our embarrassment. But she taught it to her kids. So I just want you to remember that really sensuality is innocent. I mean, we're responsible for how we use it and connect with each other, but that we shouldn't have shame to live in a human body and, and that really experiencing this in each other. Your soul came here to have this experience. Guess what? We made an app. Like, consciousness was like, maybe I could make an app where I could taste food. <laughs> maybe I could make an app where I could touch another person's body. But then we're here, and all we do is run away from each other and ourselves and feel all the shame in our human embodiment. And again, the only way to undo these negative patterns you know, that we hold in our memories is through our body's release, not the mind. So I'm gonna invite you to do just a little practice. We're only gonna do this for a minute. And even that, you can just get a taste of how powerful it is. So I want you to turn to somebody sitting next to you. And we're gonna do the first point of connection of the kiss connection. So you're gonna take your right hand and put it over your partner's heart. So taking your right hand, put it over your partner's heart. Let's get started really quickly. So we don't have much time and I wanna give you this experience. And take your other hand and put it over their hand so you've created an infinity loop of sharing this heart energy called oxytocin, love and bonding, which is present and released during breastfeeding, hugging and sex. And I want you to start breathing at the same time as your partner. So the first point of connection is hand to heart, creating this infinite loop of energy of exchanging oxytocin and the love and bonding hormone. And then I want you to share the second point of connection, inhale together with your partner. Listen to the sound of their breath and feel their chest rise under your hands. And then as you exhale, feel their chest dropping down and inhaling together, long, slow, deep inhale, and exhaling together, long, slow, deep exhale. And notice as you begin to pace your breath, 
you begin to be more intuitive to your partner's experience. And you can feel what they feel. And now I want you to keep the eye connection. Now, if this is too difficult or it makes you a little embarrassed, close your eyes. I just want you to be able to work where you're able to work. But if you're able to, then keep your eyes open. And as you look into your partner's eyes, I want you to see the whole room around them as well, which softens your gaze. And inhale, receiving this energy from your partner through their eyes, through their hands. Exhale, sending energy back through your eyes, through your hands. With every inhale, I surrender and receive this beautiful, bonding, sensual connection. Exhale, sending that energy back and letting go of any expectations. And as you gaze into your partner's eyes, just know your eyes are the mirrors to your soul. And when we are able to see that deeply, we remember for just a moment that we're all just here in the theater of life to play different roles and sometimes the roles are pitted against each other. Sometimes a mother and a child or are in a relationship our roles mean that we just can't come to an agreement, but we can remember in this moment that that person is a soul. And deeper than these moments is recognizing that that soul is here to have its own experience. And when we can let go of the shame of our bodies, of our humanity, of our sexuality, of our sensuality, when we can let go of that shame and biohack that, you can start to level up every area of your life. And just a few more breaths, holding this connection, the kiss connection, kinetic, intimate, sensual, slowing down, undoing years of inhibition just think, I've had husbands and wives who've never held each other's gaze this long. Now imagine if you could take that to making love. Now imagine if you could take that to everyone you meet or in a board meeting or with your own family. We can make a different world. Take a last inhale together. Inhale, receiving energy from your partner, from their eyes, their hands, their heart. Exhale, sending it back and letting go. And now just bowing to your partner and thanking them for sharing this human moment of awakening through our senses. Tantra is awakening through our senses and connecting mind, body, and soul. So I just want, time's almost up. You can visit more in the break. I just wanted to thank all of you I want, I want to thank all of you for being brave and for sharing this space with me and for being part of the paradigm change. It's only the beginning. We're breaking down shame and taboo in the world. I love all of you. I love all of you. Hi, everybody. We are back in studio, and as you can see, I managed to rope in <laughs> Sam Isadora. She's actually absolutely real. <laughs> she's just at another <laughs> event down the road, and um, realizing that she was here, she was very kind to say she would come by the studio and and do more of a live session with us today. So, so. since so this was a rare treat, Sam was watching the live session. She realized we were broadcasting from just a short distance away. Texted us, and Mia said, "Sure, <laughs> come on in." And um, I'm like, "Wouldn't you like to have me in person?" Amazing, I, amazing. <laughs> people are saying they are. So I'm reading the, the comments. Sam, people are saying they are te tearing up. They are so excited that you yeah. are here. Powerful. So guys, your biggest question for Sam, since Sam is actually here live in the flesh. She gets to answer your biggest questions. What would be your biggest questions for Salm about her speech, about, you know, her story? She's the author mm -hmm. of Mind Valley's Tantra Touch program, which is a program on the spiritual art of Tantra. Or if you have questions on Tantra itself, let's and, see the questions come in. And in the meantime, like, I would love, I mean, thank you guys so much for being so supportive in that comment thread as well. Like, when we did this A Fest, we took a lot of time to really set the expectation for the audience that when somebody steps up into a, a space like that and they share something which is 
vulnerable and personal mm. and maybe even controversial. It's really important to have people supporting and being open-minded. So thank you for uh, you know, being an audience out there in the internet for being so wonderful as a role. And I, I mean, if, Sam, I, one of the questions I was having was that when you did that talk, mm -hmm. to get up there and share in front of peers like that, what was that like for you? You know, um, the day before I gave that talk, I, you know, we're in Greece, it's so beautiful, right? Oh, we're in Mykonos, <laughs> it's, it's, it's heaven. But I got so nervous and also, I just felt like I was gonna be so raw and transparent. And A-Fest is like a very special place, but it's 450 people and I'm gonna see them. Not only is the whole world <laughs> gonna see this, I'm gonna see these people eating breakfast and lunch later and I'm like literally, my, my goal for my talk was to rip my guts out because I don't want anyone else to live with the shame that I did for all those years. And I said, you know, I, was, I lived through that so I can tell this story so if I can make one person not feel the shame that I used to feel, and if I can bring some um, you know, light around this taboo topic, and we can start having healthy sexuality and people who feel shame around this, if, if I can do that, I'll do it, but it isn't always easy. And the day before when I was preparing, everybody else like went on a boat trip, and I didn't. I went and I sat by myself and I wrote my notes, and I was like, for me to really be vulnerable, I, want, I don't want to be this a talk I wrote before. I don't want to be, I know my talking points, I've told my story before, I want to tell this in a way I never have told this and I really want to like share that vulnerability in that moment with those people and so I had to relive those moments I talked about and the day before just even thinking about them and like practicing saying them out loud, I was like weeping and I was like, you know, this isn't when I look powerful on stage, mm -hmm. this is the moment that people don't see when you prepare for these things and they don't see after you give the talk. And I walked off that stage and it was interesting, Vishen, you told me after you said, Sam, they gave you, he goes, oh, Sam just got a standing <laughs> ovation. I didn't notice <laughs> right. because that was my relationship to the audience. I was in a room full of people. I said, look, here's my story. Like, I'm sharing, I'm, I'm opening myself and being vulnerable to you. And they felt me. Mm -hmm. And then they, they stood up and gave me a standing because we felt each other. We had a real relationship. So that standing ovation wasn't like, oh, yay, I got a standing ovation. It was like, I... We, we, we felt each other, we went somewhere, human beings don't go. We were naked and intimate and like got rid of that shame. And you're just, uh, Sam typically, I mean, she's a very, very powerful woman. She's someone who's got a lot of, you know, charisma, but she, you know, she looks after herself in terms of the fact that if you're gonna be a woman talking about things that maybe are sometimes controversial, you have to learn how to keep your own. So <laughs> we've had Sam speak at AFI Sport 4 and she smashed it, but very much in that sense of mm. teaching Tantra, teaching the, the concept, teaching yeah. other people to connect. And so I really appreciate that you were willing to get up and to do that because mm -hmm. from that experience, I know every single person who was touched by that. And I really hope, you know, this is the first time we've shared it outside of AFI, so I hope that for those of you who watched, you had this experience too. But those people who watched Sam had you know, permission to at least start talking about it. Yeah, and that's so saying. So we had a couple of talking. questions coming. Mm -hmm. Now first, just before I read the questions, I want to just acknowledge some of the comments. Rally Stainova says, this is already the best talk of the day. Loretta said, my dear sister, you are awesome. Thank you for your story. Kathleen K, Sam, thank you so much for sharing this. Too many people have a similar history. Mm -hmm. And Prudence Praya, Praya says, she has a beautiful heart. Now here are some questions that came in, I mean, okay? I'm like, I'm not, so, I'm not faking this. I'm like, you know, like, so, that's why when I get on stage, I just know, you know, that there's people who are voiceless. And so I will get up there and risk that to give voice to that. And so to hear people say that back, like, I, it makes me so happy. Sam, so we have one person watching us today, Tango Niner, who mm -hmm. says, I'd like to hear an abridged version of what Tantra actually is and where to begin with integrating it into my life. Loved your talk. Could you give an abridged version of what is Tantra? <laughs> yeah, so, so Tantra is the ability to connect on three levels, your mind, your body, and your soul mm. when it comes to our primal sexual energy. And I feel that as humanity, we're suffering. Like these statistics are one in three women have had some form of sexual mm -hmm. violence. Again, there's so much shame. And then there's just still so much, like no, it's the last frontier. Everybody's talking about other kinds of meditation, but we're still scared even in consciousness community to talk about sexuality and we have to, we have to bring light to this last taboo. And so what I tell people is, you know, what if you're doing meditation and you learned what it did for you? Somebody from the outside would see you sitting there and say, oh, that person's taking a nap in a chair. But obviously not. Right. Like their inner experience is intense. So what Tantra is, is taking 
like regular sex, like regular sitting in a chair. And what meditation does, Tantra does that for sex and your own relationship to sexuality. You don't even need a partner. It's that this energy is already in all of us. We have primal sexual energy, we're sexual beings, but we have this like duality as human beings that we try and keep that primal part in a box. We never talk about it, we don't mm -hmm. develop it. So just like we need to develop our minds or our bodies, we need to develop all these things so we can be at our highest level of our potential. Like I believe every spirit came in this world for its own reason. Right? And that's a creative process. Consciousness is creative. And we're here to do that. We are God having you know, God's experience in these bodies. And what could be more beautiful than sexuality and touch as so God touching God? So if you God. were trying to start, like, I love this, the best description mm -hmm. I've ever heard about it. If you were to, if, like someone sitting at home who's never gone into touch, never tried it, what would be like one thing they could do with, you know, with themselves or just something they could read? What would you, how would you invite them to kind of start that journey? I would say first just own your primal sexuality. I want to give you permission, and that just sounds like not a big deal, but it's a big deal. Own your sexuality, own that you have this primal sexual energy, and then that you want to start taking steps. And the Tantra Touch course, you know, I put a lot of love and care and time into creating seven modules to walk people through this process so they can have that experience. But one of the simplest things that we do, like I help people locate where their blockages are to that sexual mm -hmm. energy and we just do a very quick practice where I have people you know, feel in their body when you think about sex or whether the, do you feel somewhere in your body that a blockage comes up right away. Someone may be their shoulder, someone may be their low back, someone may be around their throat and then I have a system where we locate what, what chakra or what developmental center that's associated with. If somebody thinks about sexuality and they feel pain around their throat or constriction breathing here, then they have a hard time with speaking their truth about their sexuality. Maybe there was a trauma or a secret, or maybe they just don't know how to talk about this primal sexual energy and own it. Uh, somebody has a pain in their low back, again, an issue with that sexual energy just not having expression, you know, or creativity. Uh, pain around the heart is then that difficulty, really like loving and bonding. So I'd say first step, it's really simple. Take that process and like, think about sexuality. Think about owning your sexuality. Take a deep breath and feel if there's anywhere on your body that that breath might be a little more constricted, put your hand on that place and then you can identify which kind of chakra that's associated with. And then just being aware that maybe you have a blockage mm -hmm. to this very natural and healthy primal sexuality and being able to start take that first step to owning that. I'm, I'm so excited because I'm doing my first, I'm participating in the first um, ever like live event that I've ever done with Sam as just to go as an attendee and to do some work with her um, next <laughs> weekend and so I'm very excited uh, and but you know Sam also does online courses and yeah. I think we have a, actually if it, customer Sam, support can so post in a May, link. In May we launched Tantra Touch and Mind Valley mm -hmm. Academy with Sam as Adora and it was a smash hit. It got three <laughs> times as many students as we initially planned because <laughs> we knew you guys are really into health and wellness and spirituality and chakras and meditation. We didn't know how you guys were going to respond to Tantra, but the and, webinar but was I such a success. Three times as many students. So intimacy. go to Mind Valley Academy, look <laughs> for Tantra Touch, and you'll be able to find Sam's course. And we'll have customer support. Place a link on the chat box right now. And in that course, I literally, like I said, it sounds mm -hmm. like such a big thing. And if that's scary to you, then it's really for you. Because, like I said, I want you to know that I walk you through step by step. I have a lot of people say, I wanted to do that, but I was just so scared to deal with mm -hmm. my sexuality. Mm -hmm. Or I have shame around owning that. And I want you to know, if that, if that scares you at all, this is exactly for you. Right. <laughs> Very much so. So there's another question here. How did, would Tantra help me in a relationship? Now this question comes from Bait Bliss. Okay, so first of all, you have to understand your first relationship is with yourself. Your first intimacy is with yourself. So how does it help you in relationships? Mm -hmm. By owning your own sexuality. I have breath work practices and things that first you even get in touch with. Well, <laughs> this is my sexual energy. Most people don't know what they're doing with it or they're, you know, TGIF, get drunk on Fridays <laughs> and like do it unconsciously and have regrets later, you know, in their relationships mm -hmm. or they bottled it up. You know, I had a, I had a woman who told me, um, she said, you know, I had this flirtatious energy and feminine energy and when I got married I put it in a box and I buried it somewhere so deep inside myself 
And she said, and now I have kids, and I feel like if I go open that box, I'm gonna hurt other people. So you have to understand, like, that relationship that she's having, she thinks that she's hurting, not hurting anyone, but that bottled up energy is more likely to act out or lead mm -hmm. to having an affair or shutting down and not having sex with her partner anymore because she doesn't have a healthy connection. She's not owning that energy. And what I teach people is you can own it, you can open that sexual energy, and right. then you can place authentic boundaries. Because once you're honest with yourself and you own it, then you can create these boundaries instead of thinking, oh, you know, if I tap into my sexual energy, I'm gonna be out of control. <laughs> and so it will help your relationships a thousand percent, whether you're single, it's gonna help you be more attractive and magnetic to people to stop, to stop repeating behavior patterns. So many young women or women of any age, they come to me and they're like, I'm having sex with men who don't value me, you know, and I end up feeling sad and disappointed, mm -hmm. but they do it over and over. Actually, there's another question here, is how do, how do you do tantra connection if you, you don't believe in men? Wow, <laughs> but first of all, Maria, so there's a trauma there. Why don't you believe in men? So I would regress her and I would say, again, I want you to feel in your body, where is that pain when you think about trusting men? So I want you to think about, Maria, um, you're in a moment, you're on a date, you have a new man, you know, you're, he wants to have sex with you, and breathe into that and be like, wow, where is that pain? Maybe that pain's around your heart because you're terrified of bonding with someone because someone disappointed you in the past. And you know, was, now I need you to get a Polaroid, I call this getting a Polaroid, close your eyes, breathe into that painful place, and give me the visual image because your life is a movie, you know, we're all, you're just right. actors on a theater of life. And, and so step away from yourself, take away the personal attachment, and just say, in the scene in that movie, when I breathe where my pain is, like I see a little girl, and maybe you see your father leaving your mother. Or maybe, you know, maybe that's not your story, but there's a Polaroid, and when you know what it is, then that's what I call getting to the sex root, mm -hmm. and understanding why don't you believe in men? because there's a reason and it's from the past and we have to stop living in the past. And so that, because what you think you do is you say, I don't trust men, but you're gonna just repeat your pattern again and again. You think you're protecting yourself, but you're not. You've trapped yourself in pain the rest of your life. You're living in that moment of abandonment the rest of your life. You have to go there, feel that pain, go through what I call a tantric heart release process. And once you let go of that, you'll finally actually be free. So you think your, your mind's like, I'm protecting myself from ever being abandoned again. No, your mind is keeping you in that moment of abandonment the rest of your life. And only by going there and feeling it in that tantric heart process can you actually start living in the present and have different situations and not live in that one Amazing. painful moment the rest of your life. And every man you date from now on, you're putting in that same role. You're, you know, you're repeating that pattern of role play because you keep being stuck in one scene in the movie. We want to get you to a better scene in your movie, right. Maria. That's a really beautiful answer, Sam. <laughs> we actually, we take one more question, which is, uh, this one, what are some small steps to live more centrally and relate more deeply? So small steps, I would say first, and starting to relate more deeply, is that kiss meditation. So you actually, if you watched my talk, you saw me take the audience mm -hmm. through it, it's a very simple one. When I did the Tantra Touch course, I had a global, you know, global tribe of over 2,000 people, and not everyone had a partner. And so then some of them said, you know, how do I do this, you know, right. opening myself and connecting? I said, visualize someone's across from you or do it with a mirror. So small steps to live more sensually is if you have a partner, do that very simple. It's only three steps. And you're going to hand to heart connection. Can you just remind them what those steps and I, are? And I just yes, want to say right. where, where you can find this. So if you want to experience the kiss meditation completely for free, just go to Google, type in Tantra Touch, and you'll see two options. You'll see Mind Valley Academy, mm -hmm. the Tantra Touch course, where you can enroll in the full program, but you'll also see a free masterclass where you get to experience sound for one hour, and in that hour, she teaches you, and she teaches you the basics of Tantra and takes you through this kiss meditation exercise that was done at A-Fest. It's completely free. Just Google Tantra Space Touch. And remember, if you don't have a partner, do exactly everything in that masterclass. You can visualize an imaginary partner or do it in a mirror and you give and receive love to yourself because that's a muscle that you built and I'm giving you permission to have a sensual life, <laughs> to love your body. If we are God here to have God's experience, what would be more beautiful than your skin? Exactly. Like sensual, what is, this is just start, just be amazed and in wonderment, the innocence of pleasure and sensuality. It's beautiful.
Beautiful. Uh, thank you, Sam, so much for actually coming into the studio, mm. for being here to answer questions uh, for all the wonderful people who have joined us today, for inspiring us with your vulnerability and your sassiness and your <laughs> juiciness. And I, did, I, 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 I laugh I, every I had, time I watch your I talks. Like, no, I, love I, it every time. I didn't get to watch that since we did it live. And <laughs> live, you know, you make things. And I was right. watching it in here, and I said, God must have made me juicy for a reason. Right? And I was laughing. I, la I cracked myself up. But. Oh, wow. All right. Well, <laughs> stay with us for a moment, Sam. Um, yeah. Our next talk that is going to be coming on is actually Vision's talk. He did oh, a, yeah. Vision mm -hmm. did a couple couple of segments at AFEST, and we're only going to show one of them today. And I, I, the reason we picked this one is because this is Vision's epic download about biohacking. One of the things that Vision does so well, and I'm sure you guys know, you're here, you know Mind Valley, mm -hmm. you know Vision's work, is he's an incredible synthesizer of information. And as you may have guessed by now, I mean, with Vision, he's been working with these various different authors. He's been working with their different programs. And uh, one thing he's learned how to do is to pick out the bits that are super, super exciting. And, and then combine them combine together. Combine them, test them, them uh, and, then, and then to share them. So the talk we're going to be listening to now is, is that... Well, can I, can I introduce my author? <laughs> I, I, I don't Would think that be it's okay? awkward. Is it socially awkward? If it is totally social? not socially okay. awkward. So, so <laughs> this talk, this talk was a talk I gave while I was in the middle of WildFit, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I hadn't completed WildFit. I was in week 10. And what I reveal in this talk is some of the things that I did that I learned mm. from Eric at Meads, but also things I learned from Dave Asprey, from mm. JJ Virgin. So I put together all the, all the various biohacking experiments I was doing. And if you want to know how I was able to transform my body, watch this talk because the answer is in there. Perfect. Right. We'll see you guys soon. Ambition's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs>